folks are, are uh, touching on um, in the chat box. And really um, what, what we think of and what emerges from the report with regards to um, developing transformative leaders um, and leadership is that youth organizers are at the center um, and at the intersection of systems um, of change and also uh, personal transformation. And um, that transformation, both personal and um, society-wise, requires so much nurturing and so much skill building um, and attention. So there's been a lot of progress and we document this in the report um, in terms of building that uh, youth leadership pipeline and advancing um, by offering um, in the report, we talk about offering um, political education, for instance. So 82% of the surveyed groups offer regular political education to their youth. And this in turn gives them the structure and the framework with, it, with which to really um, understand and contextualize not just the work that they're doing, um, but what they see, uh, the inequities and the um, systemic uh, issues that they're grappling with, um, and at the same time, uh, their own experiences. Um, they're offering a lot of uh, healing and wellness supports. 69% um, of youth organizing groups report that they're engaging in regular healing activities like talking circles and support groups um, and mindfulness activities. Uh, providing holistic supports and services um, also means that they offer um, a politicized approach to meeting young people's needs. Um, and that takes into account the systems of oppression um, that are at play on a day-to-day -day basis of their work. Um, building a leadership pipeline across the field also um, means that, you know, organizing groups really are investing in, for example, alumni transitions. Um, so 75% uh, report involving alumni in their programming for instance, um, and just under two thirds um, report maintaining an alumni database, which is key not just to um, the, the ongoing sustainability of the field, but um, to the professional, um, organizing interests um, long-term of organizers um, and leaders. So it, uh, building career pathways uh, becomes important. Um, and in terms of future directions, then um, some of what we see emerging out of this work is that there's a need and a call for creating opportunities for um, this process of creating leadership along these um, new ways of, of um, building leaders. So support youth organizing, um, both for the individual, but also for the community transformation. Um, and there's a new integrated approach that is being used. Um, this is built, building on the work that's been done in the past, right? Um, but really meeting the needs and supporting the transformation of the individual as much as the community. Um, and supporting the emotional intelligence, intelligence and development of youth organizers so that this is a much more well-rounded, um, sustainable way of staying in the field of continuing to organize and not burning out um, and cultivating um, you know, intergenerational uh, pipeline opportunities um, that alumni um, that We've worked so hard to uh, train and the skills that have been built, the history that's been built so that that stays in the field so that we can benefit so that others can benefit from it as well. I'll stop there. Excellent, and, thank you, CEO, yeah. for giving us that, that overview. Um, so now I wanna um, uh, turn it over to KG Marshall, who is the executive director of Rethink in New Orleans, a group that's been doing some amazing organizing uh, with young people of color in New Orleans and uh, re really uh, incredible thinking about what does it mean to do deep leadership development. So KG, as you come into this space, like I wonder if you can talk about like what does transformative leadership development mean to you and what have been some of your successes and failures and challenges, right? Um, as you try to think about what is it gonna take to really develop, uh, to, to develop young leaders for mm -hmm. this struggle? So. 
Um, what's up, everybody? Um, good to see y'all. Um, transformative leadership, um, the way we think about it at Rethink, um, it's grounded in political education and political development, um, allows young people to understand the systems that are at play um, and specifically understand, allows them to understand um, how their identity interacts with the system socially and politically. Um, and then um, allows young people to actually develop practices to actually practice what's necessary to build power and transform systems um, and develop the capacity of other young people to do the same. So that's, that's uh, kind of in a nutshell, like what we think of as transformative leadership. Um, I'd say we've, we've we have a pretty decent, we're always trying to, um, we're always trying to level up. We have a pretty decent way of developing leaders and leadership capacity at Rethink at the moment. Um, we've definitely had some like huge uh, pitfalls <laughs> along the way we learned from uh, when I, when I first got to Rethink. I mean, it was at the stage where we were organizationally in 2013. Um, we we're still trying to figure out how to, um, well, I should say that we started off mainly working with, uh, middle schoolers in 2009. And so where we were at the stage of development in 2013 when I came to the organization is that like most, if not all of the middle schoolers that we originally started with um, were aging, almost like aging out of Rethink, except they never left. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that they never left. They were just around a lot because we provided a really safe space and as an organization, we didn't actually figure out what else we were going to do as they got older. So in a lot of ways, what we were doing wasn't additive. Um, if you were probably like in ninth grade, ninth or 10th grade in 2012 or 13 and rethink, you kind of could, you would know exactly what it is you were going to do as part of the organization, because it's the same thing you did when you were like in middle school. And I'm not saying it wasn't effective. We we're able to do some really good things, but it wasn't really additive. Nobody was like actually being challenged to increase their development. And I'd say one of the things that was like difficult is because we didn't actually have a clear understanding. We didn't delineate for ourselves organizationally what it meant to be a part of our base and to move from our base into member, into membership, and then to move from membership into like deeper and deeper leadership. And we actually had to do that in 2013. Um, it was easier to actually sit down with young people and staff and identify the different stages than it was to actually implement <laughs> the different stages. So the things that we kind of like, the things that we ran into kind of like difficulties came in like trying to actually engage in the practice of like, okay, here's what it means to just be a rethinker, which is like somebody in our base you come to things sometimes, there's no real commitment, but you show up and then here's what it means to be a member. And now there's a level of commitment, there's an expectation, there's like a level of development that we have. And I think the for us, we ran into some sort of tensions because young people were used to being able to be at the organization without having any like real expectations of like things that they had to do. So they came because they, wanted to and they didn't come if they didn't want to but there was no expectation of like all right well if you're going to be a member now this is what you actually have to do and what you have to live into so there was a little bit of tension there because it landed at first on folks as like oh man rethink like now you can't be everything people, people are going to get kicked out people are going to you know what i mean so there was a lot of kind of work that we had to do with uh, our parents and parents of the young people, families, to clearly communicate that like, you're still in Rethink, but to be a member, which for us is, now this is when you're getting trained as for real an organizer, to be a member, there is some criteria that you're gonna have to meet. And anybody could actually join the membership classes to become a member. So you don't get like, you don't get, you know, just kind of like wave sat, sat to the side and you don't get to do anything, but you do have to come up to a particular level of, sorry, you do have to like come up to a particular level after our membership classes, we do have to see that you're practicing something and you're willing to actually engage in a particular way. And then for us after membership, we had what we called Vanguard, which is our lead organizers. So that was like another level of ex uh, um, escalation. 
And I'd say for, for that, for our lead organizers, we um, have a very intense process that takes a year of like development um, to become a lead organizer. And at each particular point, at like four different points in the year, there's an assessment process to see if you're practicing what you need to practice. And those lead organizers are the ones that are actually mainly in charge now of our membership development. And the members and the lead organizers, the ones who are in charge of our base development, and also who get to make real strategic decisions about our campaigns. So we wanted to make sure that young people were actually making the decisions about what we did tactically and strategically with campaigns where we moved. And where we were in 2013, that just wasn't the case. It was mainly adult staff that either made the decision or had to facilitate the space so that young people could make key parts of the decision, but we still made the biggest, <laughs> you know, the biggest parts of the decision. And it was, it was a long-term process. Like when we committed to do this, it took about, I would say two, three years um, to actually finally get into like a really good rhythm, a really good pattern where like everybody knew what to expect. Um, everybody knew, um, particularly like our lead organizers understood how to engage because then they have to learn. It's not just that they made it into lead organizing like our Vanguard, but now they actually have to practice those expectations and know, know what it is to actually do that. We were developing a higher level of political education. That's where we found like some tension as well. Um, and that's where we actually also had to develop the social emotional capacities, I would say, because you know, folks were running up against kind of like emotional blocks sometimes if we were doing trying to do a higher level of PE and they would just felt like the reading was hard or whatever material we were using was too hard. That wasn't just like kind of like an educational component. That was an emotional, we had to be able to figure out how to actually like engage and meet people's emotional needs at that point so they could move past those blocks. So when we're measuring, there's like the evaluation that tells us like, what do we want to do and, and did we do it? But then we have like a more transformative assessment that just says we want people to see how they've actually been able to shift over time. So we ask questions like, you know, what do you do when you uh, encounter something that's emotionally difficult? What do you do when you encounter something that's intellectually difficult or physically? We ask those questions early on when somebody is becoming a member. We ask questions like, you know, what scares you about doing one-on-ones? <laughs> what do you think? Like there's, there's all of these kind of assessment questions that over time we keep coming back to those questions so that the young folks can actually see for themselves that they've actually like, they've actually learned, they've actually led. What do you do when you are reading something that you don't understand? And at first it's like, why are we reading these? Why are we reading these people? Nobody reads this stuff, you know what I mean? And then, you know, two, three years in, they're quoting some stuff and it's like much easier to actually digest, but actually like talk about in a way that you could build the base. And sometimes when you're deep in it, you don't realize that you've actually grown. Um, so we actually have these like really intense kind of assessment points along the way, mainly so they can see the ways that they've grown. But, um, and even that was fraught with like, we've had, we had to change and shift those so many times. We were trying to figure out how to do it. What's the best way so that people don't feel like they're being judged. So it doesn't, that it doesn't take too long. Um, how do we train the young people in evaluating other, like younger organizers? So it was fraught with a lot of, a lot of like trying things on assessing when it was like an absolute failure <laughs> or it wasn't necessarily a complete failure but it didn't go the way we wanted and then trying to figure out how to shift also with the help of young people and I would say like the last thing I'll say because I don't want to take up too much time but I'd say we tried to stretch in a big way we do PE every year together as a staff and our lead organizers and our members <laughs> and we tried to stretch in a big way to include like key members of our base that our young people identified as like part of our PE process. And when I say that was like the biggest failure ever, I can't even like, I would never, I don't even know how to articulate how bad of an idea that was. Um, like, <laughs> in a, it sounded good in a really cool way. Like, yeah, we're gonna increase the political development of our base, but everything was so uneven. And our lead organizers didn't know the place to lead and when to like actually be able to just be vulnerable enough to learn that like it just it was we we're trying to do too much so too fast so I would say one of the biggest things we learned is when 
sometimes we, we would fail when we were trying to do too much too fast when it came to like the shift. And we just had to take the time that it was gonna take um, to actually to be able to build in this way. Um, so I don't know if that's too vague or what have you, but I'm just going to let it go right there. And No, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And thank you for sort of modeling the kind of, uh, you know, openness and learning and vulnerability. Like what we have been discovering at FCYO is that in so many of these spaces where we come together, it's always people sharing, right? This is what's great about my organization and what's best. And actually what we need to do is share much more of like, this is what I tried that didn't work, right? And this is what I've learned and this is what I'm figuring out, right? Um, like we need to be able to have the openness to be sharing these like these hard won lessons, right? And what we're figuring out. So really appreciate you, you modeling that. Um, uh, we've got about six, six more minutes um, um, uh, really encourage people if you haven't gone on like the Rethink website and seen like the, the model that they have for the for leadership development that's set up there, like check it out. Um, really, um, really important stuff. I know I've learned a lot from it. Um, um, Want to now open it up to other folks. We've got about six more minutes in this conversation. Um, and, and I think if folks have questions that you want to ask for KG or CO, um, feel free to ask those questions. And then also happy to hear your thoughts. What are your hard won lessons, right? What has worked? What has not worked um, for you in developing transformative youth leaders? Uh, so let's keep comments brief because we only have about five minutes left and uh, want to be able to hear from at least a couple of different folks. So be mindful of, of your airspace. And uh, yeah, so what questions do you have for the speakers and what lessons would you want to share from your experiences in doing this work? Feel free, you can drop questions in the chat if you want. You can just un unmute yourself to jump in or, um, or you can use the raise hand feature too. We're getting that. I can. I can go. Um, hi, everyone. This is Monica with the Center for Popular Democracy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, previously, I was at Padres and Jóvenes Unidos in Denver, Colorado. Um, Karen, it's so nice to see you again. Um, my question is, um, so as part of my role at CPD now, I support a number of youth organizations across the country and um, base building and leadership development and political education are sort of um, our focus is um, in this year, as we have the similar assessments about what it will require to build the type of power we need to win our campaigns moving forward. And oftentimes, um, unfortunately, I think that our ability to do really good leadership development is impacted by staff turnover, right? Um, even member retention is oftentimes impacted by staff turnover when the organizer leaves the base is impacted, leaders are impacted by that. Um, and so I'm wondering um, if you could speak to any work that you did either um, as this process was unfolding, um, you know, simultaneously to make sure that the conditions within your staff and organization were such that it would um, support this kind of shift and this kind of vision and bringing it to reality. It's a big question. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, big question. Can you, uh, so like, well, let me repeat the question. Let me see if that makes sense. So essentially, well, what I think it might be. So given like the conditions that sometimes our young people are facing, whether and staff and young people and the difficulties, like what are some things that we were able to do to kind of sustain the group while we were trying to make these larger shifts? Is that the question? Yeah, it's kind of like, what did you do to make sure that your own staff, especially field staff and youth organizers were um, at the level to do this shift? Yeah. And to carry it out. Okay, great yeah. Great question, Monica. That's a great question. Also, I'm just gonna, yeah, so. I'm going to I'm going to name like one thing that was, I named like one contradiction in 2013 like you know we didn't have things that were like additive and I think another contradiction in 2013 is that like we didn't have young people who are 
they weren't politically developed enough to actually move some of the things that we wanted to move, even the things that they wanted to move in terms of shifting power. And the other thing is that we didn't have enough um, we didn't have enough experience on staff to actually move there quickly. So I actually, we started off trying to identifying like who was the most advanced of our young people. And then they participated in an entire staff process that, that kind of led to actually develop the staff politically so that they could lead uh, the process. So the whole first year, 2013, was mainly like the folks that were identified as our young people as the most advanced and our staff leveling up um, in some like super, super key ways. One was political education, but two, we just had to, we had to know the difference between like expectations and I don't know. Well, I guess, let me use a metaphor. So when you're like working out, right? If you're an athlete and you're working out, you have to know the difference between like something that's difficult because you haven't done it before. So maybe you're trying to lift weights and like you're trying to move from like 60 pounds to 80 pounds. And the burn that you feel trying to get from 60 to 80 is partially because you haven't done it before. And you have to know the difference between that and like, oh man, I actually just kind of, I just kind of like blew out my elbow or you know what I mean? Something like that. Like you have to know the difference. And I'm saying that because like within the context of preparing the staff, in addition to political education, we literally had to like learn the difference between the stretch that's required or the push that's required and because we haven't done it before and this is too much. And I thought like given the ways in which like folks were developed and is that like they quickly moved to like, this is too much. <laughs> so it was like a little by little had to kind of be like, no, this is actually what is required to actually be able to do this work. And we had to continue to add to the skill set and kind of stretch folks so that they understood what was required to do this work. And it's a lot of kind of like coaching and pushing a little bit. And then also kind of like providing assessments, like, see, you did it. Like, you know what I mean? Like real, for real. But like that actually gave us like ground to actually be able to move in a better way. And I'd say like once we did that political education once in 2013, then it allowed us to make the case for like, and this is why we did this regularly, y'all. Like think of all the things we just learned, but conditions are constantly shifting. So we actually need to put something in place regularly so that we're learning together regularly. Um, and we're like learning things that allow us to have better understanding of the conditions that we're facing. I don't know if that makes sense, but. That was, that was great. I super appreciate this. Thank you so much. For sure. Can add a little bit. Um, to yeah, see, okay, you get the, we have, we have about 40 seconds. Yeah. So you get where it's going to force us out of the group. So see if it's your, your, <laughs> oh, your short okay. thought because 30 seconds and we're out. <laughs> the quick thought is that there are so many reasons why uh, an organizer, a leader, a staff member will leave uh, the organization. And so it's important to have a sense of um, what those reasons might be and to provide the supports um, on a day-to-day -day basis, if at all possible. So mental health supports, um, psychological services supports, um, those are important to um, really help with the burnout um, that happens because, um, you know, one of the organizers said this and it just stayed with me. We ask our youth organize, we're organizers. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I don't know if your groups were like ours, where uh, somebody was breaking down some serious knowledge when we were all forced back into this group. Uh, gotta love those Zoom timers that force us back. I, I hope your groups were as engaging. I know that uh, CO and KG were, were really breaking it down in our group. Um, so a lot of appreciation to everybody for all of the wisdom that you shared. Um, and uh, know that this, uh, won't be the last space that we have to continue to connect and build and share and learn lessons with each other. Um, so um, as we move towards closing out today, um, you know, CO mentioned in the overview is that the final section of, of the field scan is called the future of youth power. And it takes a look at the progress challenges and vision forward that we heard from youth organizers and young people who are doing this work on the ground. Um, and 
uh, you know, I encourage you to read the report, but rather than doing that now and hitting the findings, we wanted to invite a youth organizer to come and talk about where we are, um, what we've learned and the vision for the role of young people in advancing movements for social justice in this really critical moment. And I can think of nobody better to do that than James Lopez. Um, James is a native of Rochester, New York, and now the executive director of the Power U Center for Social Change in Miami. He's an alum of Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity Directors Training and a member of FCYO's board executive committee. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to James to share some of your reflections and thoughts on the future of youth power. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces and names I haven't seen in a minute. Um, just really grateful and humbled to be having this conversation and to sort of talk a little bit about what a vision or future of youth organizing may look like. Um, it feels super right for me because um, as Eric mentioned, I'm from a uh, place, Rochester, New York, uh, and then I kind of cut my teeth in organizing in Buffalo, New York, where there was no youth organizing organization. Uh, if you were a young person, you were kind of stuck in 